All right, welcome back. It is the Vegas Take. Sharp and Shapiro, so glad you could join us. By the way, coming up next hour, the minister himself, Stretch Sanders, will be joining us, uh, asking what he thinks about this new homeless ordinance in Las Vegas. And uh, first back, black mayor has been voted in in a city here in the United States of America. We will talk a little bit about that. And uh, the MLK sign forced to be taken down, street sign, I should say, uh, in one area in KC. So we will talk a little bit about that with Stretch coming up here in our number two. But it's always a pleasure to have uh, with us. Uh, she is a, a reporter for the BBC, a contributor to the BBC and Playboy magazine, also does a great job writing her own articles as a political commentator for Cheryl. Uh, Amy Vanderpool joining us right now on the line. Amy, thanks for joining us. How are you? Hi, good. How are you? Good. I appreciate you coming on, as always, Amy. I want to start off with this because I have strong opinions on it, as I know you do. The comments of Nikki Haley. So as you know, she is trying to sell a book. I believe she wants to run for office. I believe she wants to continue her, her political career. And she has made some interesting comments doing the rounds on some TV shows over the last few days. She said that she had no doubt about Trump's fitness to serve, his mental capacity. She also said that he is truthful uh, which is beyond incredible to me based on all the lies Trump and his administration have put forth in, in the last several years. What do you make of Nick Haley's comment, Nikki Haley's comments, and why, 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 why is she saying these things? She's not a stupid mm-hmm. woman. Why is she saying these things? No. Well, um, she's not truthful, and we now know that because those aren't accurate statements. And I think she's doing it because she wants to sell a book, and she is banking on you know Trump supporters to buy her book. And they, the, the Christian right turns out in mass numbers to buy books anyway. I'm not convinced they read, but they buy books. They buy <laughs> books in big numbers so that their people get pushed to the, to the number one on everything. And then they go and return a few of them like the next day. It's the whole thing they do. So she is bucking to have that book hit number one. And she thinks that her most bankable outlet is the Trump supporting background. And, you know, she may be right because I'm not sure what the the true landscape of the GOP is anymore. I don't think that, you know, the people who were Republican who don't support Trump, it it feels like they've sort of left and they're calling themselves independents and libertarians now. So she may have calculated that correctly. I think that if she's going to run for office, she's banking on the same group, you know, voting her into office as well. I personally think she's sort of, you know, killing her chances of getting elected by doing this, but she's going to make some money on this book, mm-hmm. so good for her, yeah, I guess. That, that is true. She certainly is going to make some money. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about Stephen Miller, uh, the White House advisor. Uh, a lot of people over the last several years have said a lot of things about Stephen Miller, uh, racist immigration policies, for one, pushing a, a nationalist agenda. So now there's a story out that says that uh, in the run-up to the 2016 election, Stephen Miller promoted white nationalist literature. Can you talk to us a little bit about that. Sure. Well, he not only did that, I mean, first of all, um, if you want to take a look at the story, if you follow me on my Twitter feed, I just retweeted it. It's the Southern uh, Poverty Law Center who has done the story. And they have a grouping of emails from Miller that show that he's not only that he was not only pushing racist propaganda leading up to the 2016 election, but that he was pushing other white nationalist narratives. Um, you know, after the Confederate statues were taken down and after, I can't remember the guy's name, but after one of the white nationalists, you know, was arrested for what he did, he was in support of that. So, I mean, anybody who's been watching the actions of Stephen Miller and who understands that all of Trump's racist immigration policies are created by Stephen Miller, essentially, knows that this is who he is, that he's a white nationalist and that he's racist. Um, This just sort of confirms what we've already seen. You know, if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's racist. So I want to talk to you a little bit more about immigration here. We haven't talked a lot about that with you. And then I want to get to the impeachment stuff and the hearings tomorrow because you do such a great job in laying that out. So I certainly want to get to that. But let me ask you an immigration question first. Uh, I believe there needs to be a pathway, some sort of pathway to citizenship. I don't think the wall was ever a good idea. With that being said, I think if you're an illegal in this country, uh, if you're not a felon, I want you to stay here. I want your family to stay here. There needs to be some sort of pathway. But with that being said, I do not believe if you're an illegal immigrant, immigrant, you should be allowed to get a driver's license. I don't believe if you're an illegal immigrant, you should be allowed to get a credit card. Um, I think these are issues here. Now, there are some people on the left that are okay with that. I'm not, and I'm not on the left or the right. I just think if you're not paying taxes and you're in this country illegally and you're not willing to make any effort to go about it in trying to become legal, 
why should we give you a driver's license and why you know should you get free health care and why should you be getting a credit card to me i i'm just not okay with that i think it's an extreme view on the left and i don't think it's going to help get donald trump out of office well i it okay so there was a supreme court ruling many years ago that stated that um children of illegal uh children of parents who had a legal status were entitled to a free public education and if children were in fact illegal themselves they were still entitled to a free public education because the value of of the education and the necessity to make sure these kids were in school far outweighed the cost or any arguments against so it's in a Immigrants are entitled to an education in our country. And if you sort of extend that that concept, that principle to people, um, you know, it, it's important for people who are contributing in our society, even if they're Ill- illegal, to be able to pay taxes, um, because you have to keep in mind that they are paying taxes. There is a sales tax on everything they buy. They are paying into the system. And that um, illegal immigrants are less likely to commit violent crimes than a lot of people think. So if we're trying to make sure that people are contributing and they're paying money into the system, the best way to do that is to make sure that they're healthy, that they have access to jobs, that they have access to driver's licenses, that they can get to jobs, that they can make money, so that they can pay back into the system and be contributing members of our society. Uh, and I don't uh, and I understand what you're saying. I don't necessarily disagree with you with everything you said there. My point being is that there are plenty of Americans that are not allowed to get credit cards. Maybe their credit score isn't very good. There are some Americans out there that struggle to get a driver's license for whatever reason. Right. That, but you know. illegal immigrants aren't taking away a credit card out of the hand of an American by they themselves having that credit card. It's not like there's one credit card for two people and the illegal immigrant got it. You know, everybody is everybody should be um, assessed by their worthiness equally. And if they qualify, they qualify. And moreover, you know, immigrants having driver's licenses don't affect anyone else. Americans having driver's license. Again, it doesn't take one out of your hand I hear you. to give an immigrant a driver's license. And, and now, I, what, and I, what, what about an immigrant having a driver's license but without insurance? Well, no one should. That's illegal for Americans as well. That should be illegal for everyone. Sure. I think we all agree on that. So, yeah. Uh, again, if you're just joining us, by the way, we're speaking with Amy uh, Vanderpool, a contributor to the BBC Playboy magazine political reporter. OK, so, I mean, listen, I, I think we agree on some things. Maybe we disagree on others. I just think we need to find uh, a way for these people to get some sort of pathway to citizenship. And that way we wouldn't have to worry about these issues. And then, yeah. you know, people could get credit cards. They could get driver's licenses. Why? Because they're legal. Let's find a way for the good people. And, yes, I think the majority of illegals that enter this country are good people. I'm not going to take the Donald Trump route or the extreme right route and make demonize all these people and i talk about this on the show every day the majority of these people are not bad people just because they cross the border illegally and i'm very passionate with those opinions republicans and democrats need to come together illegal immigration is a problem in this country but mm-hmm. let's fix the problem yeah. and let's find the good people if you are a felon get the hell out of here as far as i'm concerned but if you are a good person who's never committed a violent crime never committed a felony I want you and your family to get some sort of pathway to citizenship. That way, you get whatever you want. Get 30 credit cards. Get 30 driver's licenses. You know, I mean, I, that'd be a pretty big family. But you understand <laughs> You understand, You understand what I'm saying, Amy, I'm right? A large family, that's true. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. And I agree. You know, I agree that there needs to be a pathway to citizenship. But, you know, it's, the immigration issue is so complicated. It's so incredibly complicated. There's a great documentary a documentary called The Senator's Bargain. Everyone should watch it. It details you know, the last 30 years of this whole issue and why it is such a problem and why it's so complicated. I mean, before you even get to, like, you know, the partisanship arguments on either side, why why it's really hard to fix and why there are so many problems and why it's going to cost so much. So I agree. You know, we we already have a lot to fix with regard to the border without, without putting people in cages and without getting to the human rights violations, you know. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I agree with you. It's just very complicated, and Trump is not handling it well. No, he's not. We agree on that. So, Amy, we had yeah. a we had a spirited debate about a, a Canadian sportscaster named Don Cherry who was just let go after 50 years yesterday for, for a comment that he made. Uh, he, he he said these people and or you people um, on on television, and he was and he was fired from his job. Do you think that he should have been fired for making that statement? Wow, Canada's not playing, huh? No. Um, do I think he should have been fired? I don't know. I haven't heard it, and I don't 
So it's hard to tell the exact, like, you know, intimation and the context of it. Yeah, no, to- um, totally understandable. It's just, a, yeah, go ahead. But if you take, here's the thing, though. If you take a man who's done a job for 50 years, and I'm going to assume he does his job very well because he's had it for so long, like, I'm going to assume he's, he's a beloved kind of guy in his field, right? Sure. You know, for just saying, you people, uh, I don't know, it, did, were there other... Were there other things attached to it? Was it a series of things like leading up to it where they were like, okay, enough because that's too much? Or was it this isolated incident where he misspoke and didn't – what was his intention? You kind of need – I need a lot more background to that. Yeah. If it was just that isolated incident and he was speaking quickly and he misspoke and he wasn't thinking about what he said and then he went on to issue – a retraction and say, you know, it was wrong and he realized why it was wrong, then that does seem kind of harsh. Yeah, I mean, and, but, we, we, and we did an entire segment on that uh, last segment. Some people agree. Did he some apologize? People, uh, no, he actually doubled down on his comments. So, you know, uh, it well, is what see, it there is. There you go. Yeah, it is there what it go. is. It is what it is. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I, yeah. I don't I don't think he should have been forced to resign because he's been doing it for 50 years. Uh, I kind of uh, on his side on this one, I think there's a fine line. When you say you people, maybe he, he didn't, uh, he wasn't eloquent, but, you know, it's a fine line between that and and I made the point of the things that Donald Trump says, calling uh, Mexicans rapists and bad people. And I suppose some of them are good people. There's a fine line with the things you say, and we need to be we need to show a distinction between that. Uh, Donald Trump says egregious yeah, things. But, and, yeah, go ahead. But if you're going to double down on it, if you're going to double down on the state, he didn't apologize. Then you're essentially yeah. right. Well, yeah, and you're admitting that you didn't make a mistake, you didn't misspeak, and that you meant exactly what you said, and that is problematic. I think I think the point he was trying to make, I agree with. I think the way he said it was wrong, and I agree with you. He shouldn't have said "you people" because I think that could be construed as a racist term. All right, I want to talk right. about I want to talk about the impeachment process because uh, Amy, you do such a good job in uh, laying it all out for us on social media. Okay, so the hearings are on television tomorrow. I've kind of compared this to the O.J. Simpson trial where we had cameras in the courtroom and people on their lunch break. Oh, I hope we're going to have a better result, though, Brian. I hope we're going to have a better result on this. Trust me, I'm not an O.J. defender. (laughs) Maybe he's listening since he lives a couple miles from the studios here. But uh, but listen, uh, I just compare it to the fact that this is must-see TV, right? I mean, it really is. is. So can you give people a rundown on what you expect tomorrow uh, who is going to be testifying first? Who is going to be up there tomorrow? When does it start? Where I'm, I would imagine we'll be watching it on every single national network, right? Right. We will. And you can also follow my Twitter feed because I'm going to be live tweeting everything. A lot of people are going to be at work or, you know, a lot of people are fed up and they can't handle I can't understand that, but they can't even tune in because they get so stressed out. So if that's a situation for you, but you sort of want to know the the big points in a sarcastic tone and you want to be able to laugh about it, then you want to follow my Twitter feed because I'll keep you updated. But what we're going to see tomorrow is we're going to hear testimony from former Ambassador Bill Taylor, and that's going to be juicy because Taylor was the first one to come out and say flat out, you know, Trump did, in fact, enact a quid pro quo, and here's my proof. So Bill Taylor has a lot of details. He has a lot of details about conversations with Tim Morrison, who basically relayed all of the information that proves the quid pro quo. He has a lot of information about um, other details leading up to the events that prove that, in fact, it was an intentional quid pro quo. You know, Taylor is really damning to Sondland's testimony as well. And Sondland could be in a little trouble because, you know, he was skirting a lot of issues. So it's going to be interesting to see what he says. The other thing about Taylor that's interesting is he is a longtime ambassador and he is very, very credible Mm -hmm. and reputable. And he's very well respected on both sides of the aisle. He's considered to be the top of his game in what he does. So, um, you know, I'm interested to see how Republicans treat him if they go after him and go for the jugular because he's so well respected. The other guy we're going to see tomorrow is uh, George Kent. He's kind of flown under the radar. Now, he's important because he seems to be involved in every little conversation that happens with Bolton, with with all these side players, you know, they're like, oh, we talked to George Kent. Oh, we talked to George Kent. So he's going to have some interesting information as well. It won't be as juicy as mm-hmm. Bill Taylor's, but it's going to be sure. good. It's going to be good additional meaty information, right? Yep. And then on Friday, we're going to get to um, Ambassador Yovanovitch. Now that's going to be gonna good. That's going to be good. Because what yep. she's, that's going to be so good because she's going to essentially talk from – a more emotional place of 
what it felt like to be literally caught in the middle of this because right. she was the former ambassador to Ukraine that Trump called home when it was clear she wasn't going to play mm. ball and she became a liability, right? And the other thing about um, Yovanovitch is she has an impeccable reputation and there was absolutely no reason for her to be fired. And all of her colleagues said, said so, but nobody would back her up. So she's going to be giving testimony about wow. how the State Department was completely in bed with Trump on mm. all of this. Nobody had her back. Nobody was willing to stand up. And several people said to her, hey, if you want to fix this, you need to start, you know, you need to start fawning all over Trump. So it's going to be really dramatic and juicy. Thank you for laying that out for us. Again, if you're just joining us, Amy Vanderpool, a contributor to the BBC, also Playboy magazine and uh, writes her own articles there. Cheryl does a great job. Okay, so, Amy, obviously you and I agree. We believe that this is an impeachable offense. I've been saying that since day one. Well, I, I, I don't know yet. I, I'm not willing to say it because I haven't seen the, I haven't seen the evidence. I want to see what the House comes down. I want to see what the charges are, how many charges and how many counts there are, and what they claim their evidence is to back it up. Do I think there was a quid pro quo? Absolutely. Yeah. Are they, you know? But I need to see what the charges are before I say yeah. Fair, I, fair, I fair enough. Know. Fair yeah. enough. I think what we already yeah. know, I've already made my uh, opinion. I, certainly I'd like to have okay. more information, but what's out right now, my opinion is he absolutely should be impeached for this. Now, my co- no, so, so there's not a lot of fun in agreeing with people. So, J.D., I know you've disagreed with me on this one. <laughs> you do not believe, J.D., that this is an impeachable offense based on the information that we know now. Explain to Amy why you feel no, that I, way. I, I have a hard time discerning between this and... And negotiating with as president of the United States, and there's been, you know, there's one every four years or eight years. But what se- what separates this from negotiating with the, the leader of a foreign power or a foreign country? Go ahead, Amy. Well, I'll tell you, the difference is that when and 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 the president does negotiate with foreign countries all the time um, and engage in quid pro quos that are acceptable when they are negotiating on behalf of the country and they are trying to get something that benefits America, and they are giving something that benefits the other country. Those kind of foreign relation quid pro quos do happen all the time, and they're certainly fine. But when you have the president of the United States negotiating a quid pro quo to receive something back that benefits him personally by going after his political opponent to help get him reelected in 2020, then we have a problem, and then it's an abuse of power. Right, and and he was... First of all, Joe Biden is not his guaranteed political opponent in 2020. There's there's right. there's several right. others that, that could foster. Out, he wanted to take him out of the news right. So that that wasn't and, even an office. And, but Joe Biden's been in office off and on for what 35 to 40 years, and he was mm-hmm. he was in office under under Barack Obama. So if he was you know committing or if, if if he was committing crimes while he was in office he under, wasn't. under under, but I'm he saying but, but if he was, why is he not why is he not immune to looking into just because he's running against the president because he's potentially because running against Donald Trump. Into. Because it was looked into and it was investigated and it was found that he was not. And these claims are false because it's a narrative they're driving in order to back up Trump, to get Trump what he wants, to 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 get rid of a political opponent. They're purposely false claims and they're using them to bolster Trump's position and to dirty Biden and to, to say things that are not in fact true. There have been investigations. They are not proven. They are false. And he's using this narrative to drive his own self-promotion. See, to me, that's the root of all this stuff. Uh, There is no evidence to support the fact that uh, the Bidens broke the law. Now, you could make the argument that Joe Biden's son probably wouldn't have been receiving $85,000 a month. But nepotism isn't illegal. But that's my point. If you look at the Trump family and you look at Ivanka Trump and all the dealings she's had with China since Donald Trump became president, listen, if people want to make it against the law, then I'm all for it. Fine. But right now it is not against the law. And it is clear based on the evidence that the Bidens did not break the law, even though many people on the right, including that moron Jim Jordan, want, who, who, by the way, is a pedophile enabler, wants you to believe that the Bidens are just the worst people in the world when it was, you know, that that's the thing. It, it's usually people that scream stuff like this that are some of the worst people. I wanted to ask you about this before we let you go, Amy, because this is a story that really has bothered me and many. Okay, Jordan was the assistant wrestling coach, okay, at the time mm-hmm. when almost 200 kids were molested sexually. Several of those have come forward and said they spoke to Jordan about this. And Jordan said, yeah, 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 we know, according to at least one report. First of all, why would those kids lie, number one? And number two, how is it that Jordan is still a member of Congress? 
Well, the second question, I want to take that last. Okay, so first of all, the second claim that Jordan was told about it was by another coach who said to him, and this is the second report of another coach telling Jordan, hey, this is happening because they were talking about this guy in the shower being inappropriate. And Jim Jordan said, yeah, 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 we know, we know. So it's not just here. It's a separate credible source saying it. So it's not just the kids who are claiming that they were uh, molested or abused who have a vested interest in the outcome. It's an impartial party who isn't even a part of the lawsuit saying, uh, yeah, we told him and he knew and he didn't care. So it's incredibly damning. Um, and it's just, you know, it's person after person after person. Everyone knew. And it just continues this cover up, you know, it's a lot like the Sandusky one with all of the football. I mean, these things have been going on in sports in every arena for a long time. And, you know, the last couple of years have seen a floodgate opening of, of all of us saying, you know, we're not taking it anymore, especially with the, the, the ruling in Michigan against the gymnastics coach where he was actually prosecuted and criminally held liable. So mm -hmm. um, it, if Jim Jordan were a Democrat, he would have already resigned because it seems Democrats take these things seriously. Look at and Al Franken. Look at Al Franken. He had to resign it. over a, right. a few inappropriate exactly. pictures. Or, it's, or Katie Hill. Exactly. It's, it, it's or Katie Hill. Exactly, or Katie J.D. Hill. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah, no, that's because a very Democrats good point. Democrats don't. Yes, Democrats don't stand for it, mm -hmm. and we won't let it fly because if, if we're saying, hey, you can't do it, then we have to have but, our house in order to do so. You know, but, but Jim Jordan won't, won't do the right thing, and he certainly won't resign because no, of Republicans course not. don't the, seem to do the right that thing. That being said, out in, the, in Al Franken's case and Katie Hill's case, there was proof in the pictures with Jim Jordan. It's all hearsay. Well, if you have uh, several people that uh, were sexually molested – uh, coming forward saying that they went to Jordan and you're telling me that the assistant wrestling coach at the hands of almost a couple hundred students yes. that were sexually molested and you're telling me Jordan didn't know anything about it. I'm just I'm sorry. I'm just I don't buy in, it. In, in, one, in one case, there's hard evidence and one side there isn't. But, but let me say something. If you're in a court of law and you swear a witness like the second coach and he testifies that this in fact happened, then you have credible testimony and that is evidence. I agree. I agree completely. But Jordan is a coward and he will not step down. Okay, Amy, before we let no, you go. I'm just saying that yeah. that is evidence that rises to the same level oh, no as question. Hill and Franken. I agree with you. No question. Yep. No question. Yep. I, I Point taken. Okay, Amy, before we let you go, I wanted you to give out a little bit of that information. Talk about where we could find your articles, where we can find you on social media if you can. Sure. I write the Shiro newsletter over at Substack. It's shiro.substack.com. I have an ongoing impeachment cheat sheet that gives you all of the information you need with key dates, links, summaries, everything, just to check in on what's going on. And I'm doing a lot of special uh, posts this week with regard to the impeachment. I'm doing a special one tomorrow about how things are going to change with procedure on this hearing and what we can expect. So come on over and check me out. Great job, Amy. We always appreciate you coming on and, and laying everything out for us. You do a fantastic job, and we're going to put that cheat sheet up on our Twitter page as well. Thank you so much for your time. Excellent. We'll catch up with you next week. Okay, Amy? Okay. Thanks, guys. All right. Appreciate it. Bye -bye. Thanks a lot, Amy. There you go, Amy Vanderpool.